about our father's business. John Wesley is renowned for saying, <clears throat> God does nothing except through prayer. You can't really say it's a mystery, but it's a lot of, uh, maybe, you know, a lot of Christians don't realize the value and the uh, position, the importance of, of prayer. Uh, if God's going to do anything, he's going to do it through you. <laughs> Amen. So that means we've got to make ourselves available and yield our, <clears throat> our bodies as living sacrifices and our tongues and, uh, <clears throat> and pray for those things that the Lord has laid on our heart. And um, <clears throat> tonight I want to talk to you something that I believe uh, is laid, the Lord laid on my heart, of course, about prayer. That's why we gather on a Wednesday night, isn't it, to pray. We're not here for ourselves, but we're here to stand in the gap, <clears throat> particularly for our nation, Israel, other nations uh, of the world. <clears throat> and, uh, you know, we had the three days conference around Smith Wigglesworth prophecy about the word and the spirit coming together and praying about this. And I think tonight will help us in maybe some next steps forward i believe the lord has spoke this into my heart so uh let's just begin once again from james chapter 5 <clears throat> uh, our foundation on scripture here and then we'll go a little bit <clears throat> uh, further from there Are you there? James chapter 5. <clears throat> uh, this whole passage really is about prayer. And um, he finishes it up there about praying for people who wander away from the truth. But in verses 15, he said, The prayer of faith will save the sick. Now, not every prayer is prayer I mean every prayer is prayer but not every prayer is the same there are different prayers in the Bible here it specifically mentions the prayer of faith the prayer of faith he said will in this instance he's talking about people who are sick and he said the prayer of faith will save the sick well faith begins where the will of God is known Faith is not wishful thinking. Uh, if you're not sure if God's going to answer your prayer, I tell you right now, He probably won't. <laughs> Did you hear me? If you're not sure, faith is the substance of things hoped for, uh, or the surety of things that we hope for. Faith is about being sure. Have you know the widow? Uh, not, um, uh, not the widow, the, the woman with the issue of blood. Uh, she was what? Sure. <laughs> Jairus was sure. The, the two blind men that followed Jesus, they were sure, fully persuaded. You can't pray the prayer of faith for anything in your life unless you're sure. Amen. You've got to be persuaded that God will answer your prayer. Amen. If there's any measure of doubt, it can't be a prayer of faith. There are other prayers, but this one here, he's talking about prayer of faith. Then he goes on down, verse 16, he said, Now confess your trespasses to one another, and what? Pray for one another that you may be healed. And then he says, The effective, fervent prayer of a righteous man avails much. The effective, fervent prayer. So, not any kind of prayer. He's very particular here. That the kind of prayer that is effective or that avails much. He says, he uses here this word fervent. It's a very difficult word to, to if you look it up in the Strongs and things like that, very good, difficult word. But in essence, it really means to be at work. <laughs> Amen. So what we're talking about here is that, is that the fervent prayer or the effective prayer is the prayer that works. And that's really what comes down to. Uh, we just don't want to be praying tonight to, to ease our conscience, to soothe our emotions, to say we prayed. We're here to, be, to, 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 to work it. Amen. We're here to get results. 
Amen. And the, the, the effective, fervent prayer. Remember the Bible talks about the church who were praying all night. Many of them prayed all night for Peter. And it says they prayed uh, constantly. But it, it's actually not because... <sighs> You know, you can't pray constantly the prayer of faith. The two just don't mix together. But when you look it up in the Greek, that word constant is actually fervent. That's really what it means. They prayed fervently. Because Herod had already killed James. Amen. And then you know the church didn't pray. When they woke up and realized, hey, they began to pray. Because prayer changes things. Prayer brings the power of God into the situation. That's what it's about. Amen. Not just praying for the sake of praying. Prayer is the avenue or the channel or the vehicle that God uses to effect the power of God. The Amplified says the fervent, earnest, heartfelt prayer makes tremendous power available. Did you hear that? Tremendous power is made available. How? Through effective prayer. Which means we got to know how to pray. Amen. So we're not just firing up arrows and hoping for the best that's not the prayer of faith amen you got to be sure that what you're praying is in line with the word of God therefore you're persuaded that God will hear your prayer when you pray when you pray you believe you receive and then you step on over into the realm of expectancy because if you believe you've already received you're expecting what you pray now to show up here it may show up you know milliseconds or it may show up uh, uh, you know tens of years later in Abraham's case 25 years right but there's an expectancy and there's an action that follows on from the prayer of faith and then he goes on now to mention Elijah and he says that verse 7 he says Elijah was a man with a nature just like ours so now question why did the Lord tell us that Elijah has a nature just like ours why, why, what's he trying to highlight here to us? Well, he's trying to highlight here that this kind of praying is not for a select few. It's easy to think, well, Elijah was a prophet. He's a great man of God. But the scripture here is telling us he had a nature like us so that we don't elevate Elijah. That we understand that it was the power of prayer that did it, not Elijah. Because Elijah had weaknesses just like you and me right he had insecurities he wanted to commit suicide at one point amen it wasn't elijah was a great man it's just elijah knew how to pray the bible says he caught down fire on a few occasions amen so the purpose of a mention elijah here is to elevate the power of prayer for any one of us amen you don't have to be a prophet because he was just like you and me. As a matter of fact, he wasn't even born again. So we had an advantage to Elijah. Amen. Because John the Baptist was the greatest of the old. And now he's the least compared to you and me. Amen. So he is a nature just like us. And what happened? He prayed. And he prayed what? He prayed. Go back. Sorry, previous word. And the Bible says he prayed earnestly that it would not rain. Now we looked at that. Do you remember? The... the, 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 the <laughs> what the bible calls earnest prayer prayer is really agreeing with god and declaring what god said that's really what it comes down to binding and loosing right the prayer of faith that jesus says is in the context uh, when jesus talked about mark 11 24 what sort of things you desire when you pray believe the context of it is speaking to the mountain amen so here he says that Elijah prayed earnestly, but when you look at it, there's no account of Elijah, you know, sweating and, and praying, right? He just says, at my word, there'll be no rain. And the Bible called that earnest prayer. Amen. Praise the Lord. So, so many times when we're in the spirit and we're praying and so forth, things will come up. And God wants you to open your mouth and you declare certain things. You declare things over your family. We declare things over our nation. We agree with God and we're praying out the mysteries of God if you're praying in the spirit or declaring the counsel of God in our own understanding. So he prayed earnestly, it would not rain. And it did not rain for three and a half years. And the Bible says then he prayed again. Right? And the heaven gave rain. And what happened? The earth produced its fruit. Now you, you know, you heard I've said this a number of times, these are really just types and shadows for you and me now in the new, <clears throat> uh, the, 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 the new uh, covenant. Um, 
but uh, Elijah right you know why, why he prayed right he's looking out the land the land we, we, we found out that the, the purpose of rain ultimately is to bring the fruit of the earth to bring a harvest right you in the natural if there's no rain on the land the the the, the harvest the crops will fail the animals won't be fed many animals might die people might die prosperity of a nation goes down it's hard times when there's no rain in the land elijah was in that situation and after three and a half years now you have to ask the question why three and a half years we'll come on to that in a minute all right but after three and a half years the bible says he prayed again this time so his prayer of faith was working right he wasn't praying every day for three and a half years Amen. The Bible says when, when, when he prayed a second time, doesn't say he prayed seven times. It just says he looked seven times. Amen. So he's not praying every day, oh Lord, Lord, stop the rain, stop the rain. He prayed one time. Amen. And the, the power of God, the effective verb of prayer, makes tremendous power. Went up there into the heavenlies and affected all the clouds and the meteorology and the the the, the what you you know the jet streams and goodness knows what else is going on up there for three and a half years. And then he prayed again. Suddenly everything changed. Amen. Well, there's no life without water. You got to have water. You can go without food, but you can't go without water for more than maybe a week. Amen. When when, when the rain comes on a land, it transforms the landscape. Amen. It causes seed that's been dormant to come alive again. It brings revival, which is what we are talking about in the context now of rain because rain in the Bible becomes a type and shadow of the outpouring of the Spirit of God so just like this natural rain there is spiritual rain and just like natural rain causes the earth to bring its harvest spiritual rain produces a spiritual harvest Amen. spiritual rain the Bible talks about um, uh, in Peter he said, uh, Peter got up and he said, repent therefore and be converted so that times, now notice that, underline that times, because in the Greek it really means seasons. Seasons. He said, repent, he said that times of refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord. Well, when there's, when there's rain, what does that do? It revives. If flowers can be wilted, you know, just barely getting by, but the water comes and they refreshed. Amen. Renewed life begins to burst out. A desert can be transformed into an oasis. You've all seen it on the, on the nature programs and so on and so forth. And he said times of refreshing. In Psalm 72 says he will come down to Mount God like rain upon the grass. You know when Peter got up on the day of Pentecost. He's referring to the book of Joel, the prophet Joel. And then I'll pour out my spirit. Well, he knew you go back to Joel. It talks about God coming in the former and the latter rain. Rain. The, 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 the nation was in it was there was no rain the nation was in a crisis then on top of that the locusts had come in and they'd eaten everything and it was a mess but the people began to seek God what what were they doing when when when, when, the, when the Holy Spirit came he said I'll pour out that that's water he said I'll pour out what were they doing they weren't sitting at home watching EastEnders come on they were he said Terry they were praying they were in the upper room they were doing exactly what Joel told them to do rend your hearts pray cry out to the Lord for it will come to pass in those days I will pour out of my spirit amen and revival broke out and thousands of people were getting saved daily they were adding to the Lord those who was being saved Amen. But it wasn't just a sovereign act of the Lord. He said, he said, repent that times or seasons. The Bible talks about the early rain and the latter rain. And incidentally, this is one of the first things that God said when he brought Israel out of Egypt, where they had to work, they had to work the Nile to get water and brought them into the promised land where it was the blessing of the Lord, where the rain would come down from, from the mountains and fill up Lake Galilee and so on and so forth. But it was a sign. It was a sign that things were not right 
because God said if you step out of line and you serve other gods and so on and so forth he said I'm gonna shut up the heavens and there'll be no rain on the land so in a time God's people didn't have rain it was a sign that something was not was amiss with their relationship with God so we can learn greatly from that because when you bring it through to the cross now in the new covenant and we see the rain really just like this natural rain God said I'm gonna to come to you like rain he's not rain anymore that the Holy Spirit is not a dove but he said I'm gonna to come to you like rain Hosea 6 and verse 3 said he will come to us like rain like the former and the latter rain the latter rain is what brings the the, the, the former rain is what waters the seed and so forth at the beginning of the harvest the latter rain is just before the fruit gives up the full harvest God says I'm gonna come to people like rain and when he comes like rain what happens there's revival there's a bursting forth of life of times and seasons of refreshing you can't have rain all the time but there are times amen amen and so what was Elijah doing why was he praying for rain Because something came up in his heart. He had something in his spirit. It's time to pray. I can sense something is going to happen. He said, I hear the sound of an abyss. It wasn't a natural. He didn't see nothing. When he looked out in the natural, all he could see was devastation, barrenness, and dryness. But in his spirit, he got a witness. He said, I know something is about to happen. He said, it's time to pray. Come on. He, took, he went up the mountain to pray. Ahab got in his chariot, and he went back to eat and drink. This is just typical. Come on, the world is eating and drinking. But if you got and a spiritual nous about you you can hear down in your spirit it's the right time come on saints it's the right season now it's the time not for eating and drinking but let's get up the mountain and let's pray because I can hear there's a sound the earth is getting ready for the greatest outpouring of the spirit of the Lord that the world has ever eaten and it's not just all up to God you and me got to get over and agree it's time to pray saints it's time to hook up with the spirit of the Lord because you know and I know in my heart God has said there's coming a time when the word and the spirit are going to come together and he says going to touch the whole world amen amen those of us are spiritual come on you can't see nothing in the natural we're looking across our nation and it's broken and there's dryness and dark and there's barrenness and it looks hopeless but in your spirit you know come on some of the greatest outpourings of God have come out of the darkest and bleakest of situations our land is parched and dying and we need healing we need revival it's time to pray and God said when I shut up the heavens you know when we are not experiencing seasons and times of refreshing and it looks like there's no there's this the heaven it should be a sign to us that things are not right and it's easy to blame the devil or to blame the government but it comes back to us and he said when I shut up the heaven and there is no rain come on he said if my people he didn't say nothing about the government he said if my people humble themselves and do what pray it's time I know it I'm sick and God said Lord what 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 right but in the natural you see Elijah he went out seven times he's looking he's looking why because he's expecting but in the natural there's nothing to expect there hadn't rained there's been nothing right there's famine in the land people are dying cattle are dying it's 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 it's, it's parched it's, there's just no life and if you look in the natural that's what it looks like today but something came up in his heart that in spite of all this devastation now is the time to pray and he began to pray and because he's in faith he's expecting 
and he keeps looking and he keeps looking and he keeps looking until finally he sees way off in the distance a little weeny teeny weeny cloud the size of a man's hand. and he didn't wait around to see if this was the real deal to see whether or not God had really answered his prayer come on because he's in faith sometimes saying we're waiting for God to do something big but I tell you this before it happens out there it's got to happen in here you pick it up in here see faith comes by hearing he said I heard the sound you pick something up in the spirit and from the spirit you begin to travail and you bring it through until finally a little weeny tiny little weeny out pouring something far off in the desert and Elijah took off come on how many people today would respond like Elijah responded just on something that it seems so small you could easily overlook it but see Elijah was walking by faith just like you and me that's why we come out on a Wednesday night because if we don't pray uh, who is going to angels can't pray the devil definitely can't. amen praise the Lord <clears throat> praise the Lord so we have to respond now also I want to read you something from uh, <clears throat> from Steve Gray who been involved in a couple of you know revivals that have shaken the world and he said this revival happens I want you to notice this all right because it's easy for us just to put everything but we got to agree with God we got to we you know some things a part that you and me got to play he said that he said revival happens when God's people awake to the fact now you listen to me people who's watching on TV or whatever you listen to this a revival will happen when God's people wake up to the fact that Jesus is everything and this world has nothing to offer compared to the riches of complete devotion to him in other words something's got to happen in in the hearts of the Christian church that will produce a, com a complete devotion to our Lord and Savior he said this realization brings forth a repentance for the wasted hours the misplaced priorities and passions he said we need leaders who will lead by serving and allow their passion for Jesus to influence all that we do then we will see others being affected by revival when the church begins to operate in this way we will then see our communities affected and changed and see the great harvest of souls coming into the kingdom of God when we realize <laughs> that Jesus is everything and this world has got nothing to offer us nothing of any eternal value complete consecration for the Lord and for his cause it won't be long before we see revival and our communities changed as long as we're content with the status quo one of the number one ingredients for revival is a, is a, is a hunger because of this, you're dissatisfied with the status quo now if you have your Bibles let's go on over to the book of Haggai I want you to notice some things here in line with what we're talking about book of Haggai is a great book it's only a few chapters a couple of chapters and uh, let me give you the background <clears throat> Israel had been overrun by the Babylonians many slaughtered and some taken captive and the temple the pride and joy of the Jewish was destroyed and they went off to Babylon for 70 years of captivity and at the end of that period through Nehemiah and so on and so forth others Ezra 
the King Cyrus issued a decree allowing some of the folks to go back to Jerusalem and rebuild the temple of God and so numbers of them went back led by Ezra Nehemiah so on and uh, as is typical they started with such enthusiasm now when I'm talking and we're looking at this okay I want you to bring it through the cross because we're not building a physical temple today right but Jesus is building he's building a spiritual house for him to take his dwelling in the spirit we are all living stones being built up a spiritual house Jesus said I will build my church so again we can take spiritual truths and apply them now to the building of the church but see like so often when when people you know first come into the Lord and so on we're enthusiastic all right and we start off well until <laughs> until we begin to encounter some obstacles some opposition and we realize too it's just not as quite as easy you know this temple have been desolate for 70 years is hard work then on top of that you know not everybody in the region was happy with them and so they began to, enemies began to plot and scheme to discourage them and eventually after two years they gave up they just got the foundation and they just about got the altar done and this is too much for them and what had started so well floundered and was left not even three quarters complete just after two years and so God eventually 18 years later he sent the prophet Haggai to bring a word and encourage them and motivate them to get back onto the matter that is really uh, really matters the matter that really matters <laughs> you, you know what I mean that the, 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 to get back on get 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 priorities back in order because listen that the temple in God's own words was in ruins now I don't know about you but when you look around the world today or in just in our nation how would you describe the church well Haggai came along to to try to help him because you know why there was no rain no rain and when there's no rain it's hard there's no there's no crackle to feed the cattle there's poverty there's lack and these people hadn't done anything wrong they weren't bad people they weren't in idolatry they weren't murdering they, were, they weren't getting out getting drunk but yet there's no rain and because there was no rain they were suffering and struggling hardship and yet they made excuses they didn't connect it because remember one of the first things God said is when things get out of line huh, and there's no rain right it's a sign that things need to change you need to get back to me what really matters but they didn't connect it maybe perhaps like many of us in the church today we make excuses oh well you know the devil's attacking me just going through a hard time and we don't make the connection <laughs> that maybe there's some adjustments that we need to make corporately and individually as a church so that God will do what he said and heal the land open the heavens and pour out his spirit and you know they, they got they, they, they started well but they got discouraged now remember the reason why God brought them into the promised land was for one reason to rebuild the temple so that the nations of the world 
could have a testimony and a witness to the to Yahweh why are you me say and they started off so well and then came the discouragement and the problems and and 18 years later it didn't happen overnight it's a little bit by bit bit by bit so uh, you know first is well two shaming it's been 70 years anyway what's what's the, you know and look at my house my, my i need to i need to sort my out you need to you know and and just over the period of time it just get further and further and further away from the, the from the from from the cause the number one matter to god and so here comes the prophet haggai and i want you to notice here in verse 2 he says, thus speaks the Lord, this Haggai verse 2, he says, thus speak the Lord of hosts. This people says, now notice he didn't say my people. Normally he says my people. But see, things are out of line here. And they, people are making excuses. Things are, things are rough, things are hard. Come on, we are failing to really impact our nation. And yet, what kind of excuses do we make as a church? Not us, you know, I'm talking about the, the universal church. We don't want to change. We want to keep having church the same way and asking God to bless, pour out your spirit. But something was amiss here. And they weren't going out and serving other gods. They weren't stealing the offerings. They weren't doing anything evil. But something was wrong with their heart. Something was wrong with the priorities they were more concerned about their own welfare, their own comforts, than they were about the cause, the number one purpose that God had called them to. And because of that, the heavens were shut up. And there was no rain and they couldn't see it. You see, when the church wakes up and realizes the only thing that matters is Jesus. This world has nothing to offer us in comparison to the riches of a dedicated, consecrated devotion to Jesus. And this is where they were missing it. And he says, this people says, they were making excuses, that's why I didn't call them my people. He says, it's not time to build the house of the Lord. Now notice they weren't against building the house of the Lord. They didn't say, we're not going to do this. Their issue was timing. And God goes on to say to them, he said, he said, but is it time for you yourselves to dwell in your house while my house lies in ruins? Thus says the Lord, he said, now consider your ways. Twice he says that. The NIV says it like this, give careful thought to your ways. Now I'm not, you know, pointing at anybody here individually. This is a corporate message, right? But as a church, for us here as a church family, no matter what anyone else is doing, consider our ways. Because we, we, we can't go on doing the same thing and yet expecting a different result. He said, look carefully, give careful thought to your ways. Take a look, a God, I beg your pardon, take a good, long, hard look. Think it over. Because this is not something we can do. It doesn't matter how, how much we pray if there's no rain. <laughs> right? It doesn't matter how good the seed is. If there's no rain, there's no harvest. a good long look let's consider where are we at he said consider your ways he said you so much but you reap little how I many you know that's not okay that's not normal for a Christian or for God's people God's people should have more than enough correct so he says let's consider what's going on he says you you eat but you don't have enough you drink, but you're not filled. You're clothed, you earn wages, but it's like there's a hole in your pocket. You see, why? Later on, he says, 
He says, for I called a drought on the land and on the mountains and so forth, right? So they are struggling. And the reason that they're struggling, the reason that they're doing all this stuff, but there's no rain. Consider your ways. Now, he said, you say it's not time for my house, but what about your house? What about your comforts? The question really comes back to who's first? Who are we really devoted to? Because of the way I see it, without a total consecration to the Lord and to His cause, we, we, we're not going to have the outpouring that God wants us to give, that wants, wants us to have. He said, is it time for you? See, he's not against us having houses and all these nice things. But he's saying, listen, uh, you, you know, you, you, you should be willing to give at least equal commitment to my house as you are to your own house. Really, it should be more. But I mean, at the very least. Amen. And what was happening is these people are making excuses. So they were saying, well, look, you know, when my business is all sorted out, or when my kids are grown up, or when this has happened, or when that has happened, then, you know, then we'll be, we'll be able to come and build the house of the Lord. And this was the, 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 this was the very reason why there was no blessing, why they were struggling and, and problems and, 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 and working hard, and yet there seems to be holes in their pockets and the money going on. Because their priorities were out of balance. That's all it came down to. Not they were murdering, not they were sober, that their priorities were out of balance. They put their comfort, their homes, their stuff ahead of God's stuff. And as a result of that, God said, I shut up the heaven trying to get a sign to you. And then um, uh, uh, Haggai come and he's trying to encourage them. Look, the blessing of the Lord is there. If you'll just switch in your heart, you'll just make that adjustment in your heart. The, the God will open the heaven. The blessing of the Lord will come down come on and God will begin to raise us up again as to be the people of God and a light to the nations of the world he's trying to them and so the Bible says he was preaching unto them and these people I want you to notice these people he said uh, 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 go to verse 12 I'm coming in for a land shortly 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 he said then Zerubbabel the high priest and with all the remnant of people they obeyed the voice of the Lord their God and the words of Haggai all right then you go to verse 14 so the Lord did what verse 14 the Lord put it up there the Lord verse 14 the Lord stirred up the spirit did you hear that for me that is revival the Lord stirred up he began to stir the hearts of his own people for an enthusiasm because you and me can't do this on our own but notice it only happened until first the people decided God we're going to change our attitude God we're going to change our priority we're going to put you first we're going to go back leave all our stuff we're we going to start working on your house once they made that commitment in their heart then God came in and did for them what they couldn't do themselves the spirit of the revival began to work them up began and suddenly there was a joy and suddenly there was an enthusiasm come on come on and they began to see fruit the heavens open come on the blessing of the Lord and then he goes on to say he says the day in which we're living now he said yet yeah, one more time next chapter one more time he says I'm gonna shake all nations he said I'm going to shake the heavens I'm going to shake the earth I'll shake the sea and the dry land come on and he said he said and the, the glory of the Lord is going to fill this temple since that's the time you and me are living in when God's people made that adjustment in their heart who is going to be first place in their life God sent the spirit of revival and then he talked about the shaking of the nation and the filling of the house of God the temple of God with the glory of the Lord those days are coming saints come on everything that is can be shaken is being shaken right now for the first time in human history, the whole world was shut down. Just a few decades ago, we had World War II. The whole world was fighting each other. 
We've got all kinds of shakings going on. But notice in the shaking, God's glory. If we will make these adjustments in our heart, the glory of the Lord, come on, arise and shine. For your light has come. And the glory of the Lord is risen upon you. Behold, great is the darkness. See, it doesn't matter what's going on. God wants his glory back in the church again. He wants a church that's devoted and consecrated to him and about the cause of the master. He said, I'll build my church. We're not building bricks and mortar, but the Lord is concerned about people. He wants a people that are set aside and consecrated to him that he can open the windows of heaven and through you and me, the glory of the Lord. He said, the nations are see your light and be drawn to you Whew. amen you can hear I'm excited about this I'm always excited about my preaching you know but I'm so excited about this because you know I got this by revelation by the way I didn't get it from anybody else I got it by revelation this morning from the Lord and I believe it's an answer so where, where are we going? We're, we're singing, Lord, you had this conference, you know, what's next, Lord, what's next? I think we're going to be bashing our head against the wall until the church, all of us, at the, you know, the corporate, until we get to that place where we're really consecrated to the Lord. Because the houses and the jobs and the cars, all that will come. That's nothing. Amen. But there can only be one first place in your life. Amen. And I was just amazed when I looked at it and I thought, look at that, Lord, you know. They weren't, they weren't like, you know, the Israelites of old. They weren't serving after Baal. They weren't, you know, d d killing their kids. They, they, they were living, they were coming to church, right? There was the altar, the altar. The foundation was built. That was all. But they had the altar. They were doing their offerings. But they were content with that. And they failed to recognize that God was trying to pour them because he wanted to pour out. His spirit, he wanted to fill the house with his glory that the nations of the world would come to the desire of all nations. That's what it says in the next chapter. They didn't see it. And I think sometimes, you know, corporately as a church in, in the Western world, we're just going on like the blind. We're just, we're just not, not, not seeing the signs. Something needs to give. Something needs to change. I believe with all my heart, you know, if we'll make that decision in our heart, you can't stir yourself up. I mean, you can't stir yourself up. I mean, you can't stir up, you know, the, 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 the flat. It's got to be God. All it took for them was just a heart adjustment. They decided to heed the words of the prophet. And then the Lord began to stir up their heart. And the joy and the enthusiasm all came with that after. Amen. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. So none of us are where we should be. None of us are where we want to be. But, you know, we, all it takes is a decision in our heart. God, help me to be a vessel for honor. If anybody cleanses himself from the latter, he shall be a vessel for honor. Useful, prepared for every good work. Useful to the master's service. Amen. God has one desire. And that is to build his church. And when that becomes your one desire, all these other things will be added to you. Amen. Praise the Lord. I know I took a little bit longer, but you know, we're going to pray now. We're going to pray now.